You begin this half hour with that development in the Natalie Holloway case. Is Jorn Vandersloot ready to show police where the missing Alabama teen is buried? NBC's Michelle Kosinski is in Lima, Peru with the latest on this. Michelle, good morning to you. Good morning, Matt. Yesterday, police went over the details of the case with us, now saying they believe Joran van der Sloot targeted his victim here for robbery. And then suddenly, almost as an afterthought, revealing this, that he's telling them he knows where the remains of Natalie Holloway are, and he's willing to tell authorities in Aruba. A crowd gathered for a glimpse of the young man who has horrified Lima. While Joran Vandersloot was barely squeezed from the jail under heavy security through a crush of press. Taken to court, but not yet charged. Authorities seem to be leaning toward the most serious accusation, premeditated, aggravated murder. Carrying the strongest sentence here, up to 35 years in prison. Vandersloot, in his confession, told investigators he met business student Stephanie Flores at this casino. Here they are together on surveillance video on the last evening of Stephanie's life. They played poker, talking and laughing, leaving in her car for his hotel in the early morning hours. Vandersloot claims inside his room, Stephanie found out on his computer that he was the suspect in Natalie Holloway's disappearance, that they argued she hit him, and he, in a rage, grabbed her by the neck and beat her. So severely, her neck was broken. Now, though, police tell a much different story that Vandersloot selected, targeted Stephanie because she seemed to have a lot of cash, that the motive for murder was money, that he attacked Stephanie in that hotel room to rob her. When she resisted, he choked her. He noted that she was still breathing. There were signs of life. And with his shirt, he covered her face to asphyxiate her. Police reveal he took all of her cash and credit cards, ditched her car, headed for the airport, then changed his mind, took a cab to the border. He was caught in Chile. And now, investigators in Peru say Joran Vandersloot has told them he holds the key to finally finding Natalie Holloway, that he knows where her remains are and will tell authorities in Aruba. There's talk here that Vandersloot's attorney may try to seek a lesser charge, homicide under extreme emotional distress, with a sentence of three to five years. But a respected newspaper claiming to quote from the police psychological evaluation says Joran Vandersloot is classified as an antisocial psychopath, cold and calculating, who premeditates everything, usually acts with great cruelty, reacts with much violence, and lies too much. Over the years, he's told wildly differing stories about what happened to Natalie Holloway, most recently only weeks before Peru. As part of an undercover sting, the FBI says he told a lawyer for Natalie's mother that Natalie fell and hit her head on a rock, offered to tell where he claimed he and his father had buried her, all in exchange for a quarter of a million dollars. Her mother supplied 25000 up front for, for information that investigators found was also a lie. Police say the story about what he's telling happened here has gaps in it. And because he's told so many stories in the past about Natalie Holloway more than once for money, there's this question over whether he will finally tell the truth this time or if he's just trying to improve his situation when he seems to have few options, Matt. All right, Michelle Kosinski in Peru for us this morning. Michelle, thank you. John Q. Kelly is the attorney for Natalie Holloway's mother. He met with Joran Vandersloot in Aruba last month as part of that sting operation. John, good to see you. Good, good morning. See you, Matt. Just before I get to what happened between you and Joran Vandersloot, your reaction to this news overnight that he seems to be now willing to tell police where Natalie, Natalie Holloway's body is located. Well, I'm, I'm sure he's trying to find a way to get out of the corner he's boxed into right now, but it's no secret that he holds the key to where Natalie is and what happened to her. You, We've you, always known that. You've been involved in this story for several years now, and it was on March 30th of this year that he reached out to you in an email, basically offering a deal. He would give you information for money. What was your reaction to that initial email? Uh, skepticism, caution, assuming everything he was going to tell me was false, but had to, you know, 
understandably think that it might be true also. So we'll approach it very carefully and keep communicating. You actually approached it from two angles, didn't you? Because on the one hand, if he's going to give you information in exchange for money that leads to finding Natalie Holloway, that's a good thing, at least for her family. Sure. On the other hand, maybe this exchange of money and information could nail him on extortion charges. Well, that's it. It was a win-win situation. He was either going to pay the money and the information turned out to be true and Beth would get closure, she'd bring Natalie home. Assuming it was false, it would be extortion and wire fraud once uh, you know falsehoods were proven. So either way, he was going to be boxed in as it had. So, so through a series of emails, you guys start to proceed for, further with this deal. It eventually leads to a first meeting in Aruba. Did you bring any money with you to that meeting? Uh, no money, no recording devices. No one knew I was there. It was Easter Sunday. Only one, Natalie's mom, right? Natalie's mom and my family. It was right. Easter Sunday. It was one-on-one -on -one in a hotel room with he and I for a couple hours. Tell me about the meeting. Just, uh, he thought I was bringing the 25000 then. Uh, I engaged him in a long series of conversations, tried to get as much information as I could, uh, and then told him at the very end when he was pushing the issue that I didn't have money with me. Did he get time. angry about that? Very angry, very agitated, uh, very upset, you know, left almost immediately with me walking with him, actually. Do you, do you mind if I share something you told me uh, in, in a meeting yesterday? This is a big guy. This is a oh. physically intimidating guy, and when you he got angry over the fact you didn't have money, it was nerve-wracking for you. Oh, he's a big guy, six four, two twenty-five. You know, well built, and he's a, a, a sort of a threatening individual when he gets angry. There's no question. The, and he had a shaved head at the time. The communication between the two of you continues. Now a second meeting is set up. This one for May 10th, also in Aruba. But this time the circumstances were very different. This mm -hmm. thing was right out of a movie. There were cameras and audio recording devices. The FBI was involved. Tell me about that one. Uh, it was, you know, hatched weeks before. The FBI, actually, you know, Governor Riley of Alabama, I had reached out to him. He got law enforcement involved and through a series of, it was actually like a month and a half psychological cat and mouse with Yarn and I, but this was set up for May 10th, you know, the day after Mother's Day. The, the FBI was involved. The US they trained office. you in some ways, made sure you would be able to handle your end of this on camera and in the recording. Yeah, there were a lot of instructions given, a lot of things I had to follow through on in terms of, uh, you know, speaking, acting, placement, you know, follow through procedures, safeguards, things like that. You sure. did have money with you during that meeting, correct? Uh, when I met with Vander Sloot the second time, I had 10 grand cash. Okay, and actually, as part of the meeting, agreed then to wire an additional 15,000 into his account. So now we're up to 25,000 of the 250,000, which would be the actual agreement. That's correct. The first 25 was to be upfront for what happened to Natalie and where she was. And, and so once you paid him that money, he then gave you some information as to her whereabouts. Was he supposed to lead you to where her body was located? That was, that was, that was part of the, the agreement we had. And, you know, after spending a lot of time in the hotel room, as a matter of fact, Matt, just an aside, right before he showed up in the hotel room, all the power went out in the hotel, on the island. There was a so power you're thinking outage. this meeting's in jeopardy. I was thinking, I was in jeopardy, the meeting's in jeopardy, everything's in jeopardy at that point. But that being said, we, we went through with it, then we took a couple of car rides. He took me to the location where he said Natalie was, was, was buried and located at that time. He and said her, her body was buried in the foundation of a house. Yes. Is that correct? He showed you the actual house? I took pictures of him in front of the house, pointing to the location, and, and it's memorialized very well. Okay. At that moment, why wasn't he arrested? That wasn't my call. You know, I, I was just there to execute. The FBI was there. They were terrific guys who were efficient. They were, you know, disciplined. They did their job. They were terrific to deal with. Because if the information's correct, he's guilty of murder. If the ish in information is incorrect, he's at least guilty of extortion at that moment. Uh, I would think so, yeah. Okay, it turns out, though, the house he had taken you to, saying she was buried in the foundation, hadn't even been built five years ago when Natalie Holloway disappeared. So this was a scam. Exactly. And did he tell you that in an email eventually? Uh, eventually did. About a week later, he indicated that it was all a hoax, which was sort of his MO along with everybody, get the money and then say it's a hoax and, you know, avoid criminal prosecution. Are you clear that now here money has changed hands, it's turned out to be a hoax. Do you know, have any idea, and this maybe is not in your you know, sphere here, but why he was allowed to leave Aruba? Don't know. I mean, my job was done May 11th, and 
you know, where decisions were made. I don't think it was the FBI field agents who were making decisions. There were higher ups in Aruba or the U.S. Or, or someone would have had to make that call, whether they did or didn't or why not. I don't know. And so he has twenty five thousand dollars of of Beth's money at that point, and he goes off to South America. And you've heard the comments now. Sure. Did he travel to South America with the money you got for him? And did he then go on and commit this murder? When you talk to Natalie's mother about this and what eventually happened, especially with the murder of this young girl in Peru, what was her reaction? Well, she's, I mean, she's obviously devastated. It's a, it's a second nightmare for her. You know, she's been, you know, totally committed, totally, you know, determined to always find out what happened to her daughter and bring her home. And, you know, we don't have that answer yet. Another young girl is dead and another family's living the nightmare she went through too. So. Needless to say, she's she's distraught right now, just for the other family and the situation. So you're someone who spent time face to face with Joran Vandersloot. What's your impression of him? Is he a, is he a psychopath? What what is he? He is. He is. Uh, you know, I spent a couple hours the first time. I spent over four hours the second time with him, and you know, he's just you can look right into his eyes and see he's he's cold as ice and, and pathological. Well, John Q. Kelly, we appreciate you sharing your story with us, John. I appreciate it very much. Sure. Thanks, Matt.